All right, well, welcome. We've had some issues. I recognize that there's been lots of other Sunday school classrooms going up and so forth. Uh, I have recorded for you guys on my phone, but I have an Apple phone, and Apple does not play nice with others. And so uh, we've done everything. We've transferred it to Titus's computer. We've downloaded it on a flash drive. We've tried uploading it on We've done everything for weeks, literally, we've been working on these, and they just haven't come. So uh, Jeff's been kind enough to come in today, and we're going to record, uh, kind of catch up. And so these are not going to be, we've been doing 30-minute lessons, uh, but these aren't going to be 30 minutes. So kind of buckle up a little bit, I think about 45 minutes, and I can cover through what I kind of catch up to where we would have been if we continue to do these, maybe a little bit behind from where that would have been. And then uh, in just a few moments after this, uh, we're going to record also the uh, uh, Wednesday night as well and so uh, we'll catch up to do the same thing on there so if you get about 45 minutes worth of time I think that's going to be fairly close to being accurate uh, to that point there and so just before we get started I thought we'd go ahead and start with a crowd breaker like we normally do and so uh, we're here in the newsroom so I must go ahead and do assassins and so if everybody can uh, bow your head and close your eyes I'll make my way around touch your head if I touch your head then obviously you're the assassin and uh, so go ahead and bow your head close your eyes Okay, so um, just curious why Austin actually bowed his head and closed his eye. But anyway, we are social distancing. Nobody's here but Jeff and I. But uh, anyway, um, Austin, we still love you. So uh, I'm going to invite your attention here as we get into our Sunday school lesson here. Uh, this will catch us up, actually. So we're going to be in Judges chapter 6. Uh, Lord brought my attention through this as I was reading through it again. I'm through my third time. I'm in the book of Psalms right now, uh, reading through for this year. And uh, as I got through the Judge, book of Judges there. Lord just brought out a number of things to Gideon to me, and so we're going to discuss Gideon here. Judges chapter 6, hopefully you got your Bible there. Give you just one more moment as we turn to Judges chapter 6 and verse number 1. We're going to make our way all the way through this first chapter here. Gideon uh, is uh, really three chapters in the book of Judges, starting in chapter number 6 here uh, before this time. So we're about 1140 B.C., uh, about 100 years, a little less than 100 years, about 85 years-ish, something like that, before Saul. And so we're kind of at the end of the uh, the era of Judges. So the children of Israel have left Egypt. They've conquered the promised land through Joshua. And following Joshua, God sends them into the time of the Judges, what we call that. And so we're pretty close to the end of that, Judges chapter 5. Uh, we have Deborah and so forth like that. Now we're going to talk about Gideon. And then about uh, 85 years from now is when the children of Israel cry out for a king. And God gives them Saul, uh, followed by David and so forth like that. We're going to reference those a little bit later in our lesson today, but kind of give you an idea there. So 1140 BC, uh, 1140 years before Christ, if you will, and about 100 years, 85 years before Saul. The Bible says this in Judges chapter 6, and verse number 1, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midians seven years. And so just to be very clear, God is about to set the stage for what's going to take place through this man uh, that he's going to call a man by the name of Gideon. And I recognize we're very familiar with him. You've heard lots of messages on it. I don't know that I've ever preached on Gideon. I've referenced him a number of different times, but I've never preached through Judges 6, 7, and 8 there. Um, but so the children of Israel, as God sets the stage here, he says the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now this is the first time we've heard this in the Bible. In fact, we hear it time and time and time again. It's one of the most common phrases to actually talk about Israel is them doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And that's what we have going on right now as the Lord sets the stage. And now, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord, just to be very, very clear, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord delivered them. So the, the reference of the why the Lord delivered them is because they're doing evil in his sight. The Bible says he delivered them into the hand of the Midians seven years. And so uh, we have the children of Israel. They're not doing right. They're doing wrong. They're going against what God had told them to do. They're doing evil. Now, to be very, very clear, I want to just pause for a moment here. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and we see them constantly being judged. Uh, even when you get into the time of the kings there, uh, at the end of the time of the kings, we have uh, what takes place. The God delivers them into the Assyrian's hand and then Babylonian hands, whether in the northern or southern kingdom there. Uh, God pulls them away. Why? Because they were doing evil, because they weren't doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And I, you know, I get to thinking about uh, my own life personally and the lives of teenagers and the uh, lives that we have around here. What is it that we think we're the exception to that? You know, we find ourselves, if you find yourself and when I find myself doing things that are evil, 
we think, well, we're under grace now. Obviously, we're in the church age now. We're not in the time of uh, um, uh, the law here, the book of uh, the time of the law, as the children of Israel are in right now. This is the time of the law. But we think, well, we're under grace. But I remind you this, we're still serving the same God. And as God here finds the children of Israel, his, his chosen nation, he chose them. They didn't choose him. He chose them. When God takes his chosen nation, his people, he wanted to make his name known there so that they could spread it to the world. And, and, and folks who turn because of their testimony of, of who God is in their life. We find them doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And God delivers them. Delivers them into the hand of the Midian, which is an ungodly nation. They have nothing, uh, no morals. They have no no qualms about doing murder and, and, and all sorts of abominable things unto God. Why? Because they didn't care about the things of God. Now we have the children of Israel. God delivers them into the hand of Midian. The Bible tells us seven years. And so the first year they're delivered, now they're slaves, they're, 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 they're in oppression. It's going to get really bad for them here. And God outlines that for us in Judges chapter 6. But we find them, they're, they're, they're just, they're, the, their entire way of life has changed. And it's changed like that. Why? Because God delivered them into the hand of the Midians. And he did it for seven years. Well, so I was going to explain that seven years and what takes place in that time. And the hand of the Midians... Excuse me, the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so to be very clear, what's taking place here is the children of Israel, they're living in the land, the promised land that God had given them. They're living in houses they didn't build, they're, they're uh, reaping vineyards that they didn't plant. They're, they're, it's the land flowing with milk and honey. It's a good, beautiful, wonderful land that God just gave them. And as they go in, as in the days of Joshua, as they go in and they take care of it, they're, they're fighting for these different things. I remind you, they're not fighting. It's God doing the fighting for them. It's God winning the victory for them. Victory after victory after victory after victory. And God gives them this land. And as they're in the land, they begin to enjoy it. They begin to have a, have a good time. And they neglect turning to the one that gave that to them. And we find their time uh, conquered with the time of evil in them. And the Midianites came and prevailed against Israel. Verse number two, watch this. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So they have to leave their houses. They have to leave their vineyards. They have to leave their towns and their, their areas. And they go up and they find themselves hiding in the mountains, hiding in the dens, hiding in the strongholds. The intention of that is they dug holes in rocks or they found caves uh, uh, maybe washed out by wind or water or whatever the case is. They find themselves hiding, hunkering down anywhere they can except for where they're supposed to be. Why? Because the Midians prevailed against them. Why did they have the opportunity to prevail against them? Because God delivered the town, children of Israel into their hand. And so it was, verse number three, when Israel had sown, the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of Israel of the east, even they came up against them. And so uh, the idea here is that the sowing is they, they, they planted seed and they're about to reap it and so forth like that. But when they're about to do that, they've sown their seed, they've done all the work that they need to do here, and as they're about to reap, everybody comes up against them. And it's no longer just the Midianites. Now it's all of the neighbors. And they all, uh, verse number three, and it was so, when Israel had sown, the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And so you have the Midians, which are already prevailing against them, but now you have the Amalekites, and you have the children of the east coming from them. And so the children of Israel find themselves here bombarded on all sides. I, I've got Jeff standing coming in front of me there. And so it's not just Jeff's offensive coming at me there, uh, you know, prevailing against me, so I find myself hiding in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. But I look and there's the Amalekites coming up against me as well. I think, as if that wasn't bad enough, now I have these folks coming. And then I look to the east and the children of the east are coming up against me. And it doesn't matter where I turn, I've got enemies coming up against me. This is what's taking place in Judges chapter 6 and verse number 3. Bible says this in verse number 4. And they camped against them and destroyed the increase 
of the earth. Now I remind you when it took place. When is this taking place? Verse number three references the time, and so it was when Israel had sown. That means they planted the seed. They they watered it. They they they've done the, the they, they weeded it. They've done all the things that's going to take place here. <clears throat> it's at that time that all of their enemies come in from all sides up against them. The Bible says this, and they camped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel. No sustenance for Israel. Neither sheep nor ox nor ass. Now let me very quick. Let's define the word sustenance. It is the word where we get our word sustain. Now I'm guessing even in social distancing at your home today, uh, let's just assume you this is in the evening that you've decided to sit down and go onto YouTube and you're eating playing, you're watching, you're watching now. You have probably eaten two or three times. If you're like some teenagers I know, you've eaten four or five times today. You, you, you had breakfast and then you had a snack and then you had another snack and then about 20 minutes later you wanted lunch and so you ate lunch and you know, that was, that was a pretty feeling and so forth like that. And maybe you didn't even clean up your dishes by the way you ought to. Um, and then you, your mom's out there to take care of you. Okay. So you're eating, you've eaten uh, lunch now in the afternoon, you've had a snack and just before dinner, your mom's thinking, I'm thinking, oh, that, that growling in my stomach, it's, I'm hungry again. I, I need another snack. And so you've eaten five times and it's not even dinner time yet. You have sustained your hunger by eating. The Bible says here that these three different people, the children of the East, the Amalekites, and the, Amor uh, the um, uh, Midianites, excuse me, I almost said Gideonites, the Midianites there, as they have come up against them, they have destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance, nothing to sustain the children of Israel for Israel. Neither sheep nor ox nor ass. I, I think I, I spoke in the middle of that. Let me just read that to you one more time. And they came up again and they camped against them to destroy and destroy the increase of the earth till thou come into Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up, verse number five, with their cattle and their tents. And they came as, watch how many people came. And they came as grasshoppers for a multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land, watch, to destroy it. The intention of the Midianites, the intention of the Amalekites, the intention of the children of the East, their intention was to come and destroy the land of Israel, to take it and decimate it, make it where there's nothing worth anything there. The Bible says this in verse number six because of this. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. If you underline in your Bible, you ought to underline Judges chapter six and verse number six. Because it's a good warning based upon what we see read in verse number one. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. The result of that, God sends in the Midianites, as well as the Malachites join in, and the children of the East join in, and they're, they're just all going against them. And so they look, and all of a sudden, it doesn't matter which way they have looked, where the children of Israel had some, they look to the left, and there's the Malachites. They look to the north, if you will, there's the Midianites. They look to the east, and there's the children of the east coming against them. And so they come as if the men and the camels were as grab toppers without number. Could you imagine that moment of time? Could you imagine how bad that looks? You, you, you look ahead, and there's your enemies. And, and you, you, you turn, and there's your enemies, 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 and there's your enemies. And everywhere you look, the Bible describes it as grasshoppers. As if it was grasshoppers without number. 
everywhere you turn. There's nothing left. You're greatly impoverished. You've got no, no sustenance, no sheep, no, ax, uh, no ox, no ass. You've got nothing left in you. You find yourself living in the mountains. You find yourself living in the caves and in the, in the strongholds. You find where there's nothing left to do. Why? 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 Why, God? Why would you allow this? You see, the Bible tells us that they had done this for seven years. God allowed the Midianites to prevail against the children of Israel for seven years. And they just looked. There's nowhere to turn. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing I can do about that. I will tell you this, teens. I love the picture given to us in Judges chapter 6 and verse number 6. Because the children of Israel being so greatly impoverished. That's what the Bible says. And Israel was greatly impoverished. Greatly impoverished. They were dirt they, they were dirt poor. They were poorer than poor. They had nothing. It's exactly what God needed it to be. Because for six plus years now, almost seven years worth of time by the time we're reading this, from the beginning to this point right here, Israel had looked this way. But now it got so bad that they finally look that way. To be honest with you, I believe they actually looked that way. They finally bowed before Messiah. They finally bowed their head to God. And they said, Lord, they cried out unto him. What a picture. What an image. I think that most of the time in our lives, particularly today, all this COVID-19 on my soul, you can't read the news app and not see article after article after article after article. And it is very difficult to navigate through what's true, what's not true, the numbers and any hey, information overload. And we keep looking and looking to this expert and looking to that expert and looking to this way and, and what it was at WHO, World Health Organization, and, and the CDC, and, and, and all these things. We keep looking all this way rather than looking the way we ought to be looking. Man, I tell you, it's a, it's a great image here what we find in the children of Israel. They did this for seven years of time. They kept looking around. Kept trying to settle and then find themselves in the dens and the mountains and the strongholds. When all God needed them to do, humble themselves a little bit. I believe as looking down, they began to look up. They finally got to the point that they said, Lord, it's too much. Let me read you verse number six again to my probably one of my favorite parts of this entire um Entire book of Judges here, in this portion anyway. Uh, I'm gonna, there's a number of verses I really like, but I love verse number six. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. That's what God sent them for. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Now I'll watch you watch this watch. And it came to pass. There's meaning, there's not much time between them. The children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And so it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel. It just took them crying. It just took them saying, Lord, help. Lord, I'm at my end. Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord, this is, I, what? And the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel. I'm in verse number eight there. Which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt. And brought you forth out of the house of bondage. I've already done this. I've already delivered you once. Don't you remember the story of the of your grandfathers and your great great grandfathers, your great 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 grandfathers? Don't you remember the history of Israel here? And I said unto them, I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Watch, fear not, the gods of the Amorites. 
in whose land you dwell. I think there's a little colon here. It's important that we recognize that in verse number 10. That colon means it's that same thought continued again, rephrased in another way. Maybe a better way to understand it or said in another way. Let me read you that word again. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, colon, but ye have not obeyed my voice. The children of Israel, they find themselves, after all of this time, crying unto God, Lord, please help us, save us, help, help, help. And God sends a prophet. And the prophet takes them back to the days of Moses. Says, how did you you out of the bondage? I brought you into this land. But ye have not obeyed my voice. You are where you are right now. Because you've lacked obedience to me. And there came an angel of the Lord. And sat under an oak. How well about this? Watch it. This is going to be great. We're about to be introduced again here. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under the oak, which was an orpah, uh, uh, and pertained unto Joash, the Asper, uh, uh I did this the last time I recorded this as well, the Abazarite there, and his son Gideon, threshing wheat by the winepress to hide it from the minions. Now, I'm not quite positive how to rationalize all of that out. Because where did he get the wheat from? The land has been decimated. If he has, he's got very little. But he finds himself over in the wine press dressing me. So the, the intention is this, is that they, they take the wheat and they throw it up in the air and they allow the wind to blow it. And the, the wheat itself is heavy enough to drop, but the off goes the chaff. The chaff is worth nothing. And, and, and as some of it continues to fall, it, it breaks open more and more, and the chaff gets away, and they just keep doing this, and they keep doing this. He's doing this where? In the white press, and the Bible tells us why, to hide from the Midianites. The intention of what he is doing is cowardly. I'm, I'm hiding. Now, the Bible already said they came in to destroy the land. I, I get why Gideon wants to be uh, hidden away from here. And the angel appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee. The angel appeared. I want to make sure that you understand that in verse number 12. We're going to find a problem with that word here later in Scripture. The angel appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. That's strange to me. Gideon isn't portraying who he's actually is then. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and says, The Lord is with thee. Thou mighty man of battle. Well, the very verse before that says he's hiding. Man of valor. Uh, I, I told you earlier we were going to talk about Saul and David and, and, and their men. Uh, we have more in the book of the kings and, and that those times when it talks about David and his mighty men. <laughs> they didn't find themselves cowarding. They find themselves going down the offensive. Uh, Saul had mighty men. We, we, we find this throughout scripture where, where, where mighty men of valor take a look at an issue and they say, hey, I'm going to go take care of that. And off they go. <laughs> Gideon is cowardly. He's hiding. He's, he's over in the corner. I don't think you see there. He's over in the corner. Why? Looking over his shoulder. Why? Because the Midianites are everywhere. The Amalekites have come and the children of the East have come as grasshoppers to decimate the land so that there's no sustenance left. And we find, we find Gideon over here just just throwing a little bit up. You, you, you can get the picture of him. And the angel of the Lord, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and says, Hey, thou, uh, the, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. <laughs> do you get the see? Do you see that he's not actually showing who he's supposed to be? So we have two choices here. Either Gideon is an acting with what God has given him or the angel of the Lord was wrong 
I promise you, it's not the angel of the Lord that's wrong here. Gideon, in his cowardly approach to life, is wrong. The angel says, the Lord is with you. Mighty man of power. It's a word of encouragement. It's a word of reminder. Hey, hey Gideon, don't you know God's with you? That gives you might. Gives you valor. We in our military have a Medal of Honor, Medal of Valor. It's reserved for not those that do their job. It's reserved for those that do their job extraordinarily well. They find they're maybe on the battlefield and their buddy is being gunned down and to their own potential peril in life, they go out to save their buddy. Those are the ones reserved for the Medal of Valor. They, they said, Mom, it doesn't matter what happens to me. I'm, I'm going to go save my buddy. And, then off, and off they go. That, that is the intention of the word valor there. That, that means a great strength and opposition against you. And yet, it, it, to, 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 to the potential of your own peril, you still sit there and say, no, I'm going. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him. The angel of the Lord is with thee, excuse me, thou mighty men of valor. And Gideon said unto him, oh yeah, I totally wrong. Lord, what was I thinking? Of course I am. Let me go attack. No, that's not what Gideon says here. He says, oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all of this to fall on us? Why? If God is with us, if it's true that God is who he says he is, why is this happening? Maybe you said that. Maybe you have all of this social distancing and whatever. I have no idea. Tough to figure out what the truth is, isn't it? Well, the truth's right here in the Word of God, and God is still with us, and He's still in control, and He still promised to bless us and care for us and take care and meet all of our needs. But Gideon says, Why is all this befall us? And where be his miracles which our fathers told us? Do you remember the prophet? What the prophet took them back? The prophet took them back to Moses and said, Hey, God already delivered you out of bondage. He already gave you all of this there. But listen, you didn't listen to me. You didn't take heed to my voice. You, you obeyed not my voice, I believe is the word phrase there in verse number 10. He says, Why has all this taken place? Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? Well, the prophet already told them that. But now the Lord hath forsaken us. Whoa, there's a big theological issue right there. I remind you, think back to when we were discussing in the book of uh, Ruth there, Naomi, Naomi's image of who God was was also theologically wrong. See, Naomi and her husband went down to sojourn, right? And then they get there and her husband dies and eventually her boys die as well and and she, she comes back because she hears her bread in Israel and she, she gets back to the land and, and she says, call me not Naomi and Mary, call me Mara. For the Lord hath dealt bitterly with me. The, the Mara is the, is, the, is the word that they use. The reason she would use that word is because she would take them back to when the children of Israel left Egypt. Before they entered the promised land, they get to that place. What do they get? They get water and it's what? Bitter. And so they call it Mara. That's the intention of the word there. Listen, she had a theological problem. Why? Because she chose to leave where God was supposed to be. She chose to go against that. We find that here to the children of Israel as well. They have looked around and they said, Why have you forsaken us? But now the Lord hath forsaken us. There was a theological problem there. You see, they had, God hadn't forsaken them. They had forsaken Him. It's exactly opposite of what took place here. The Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midians. No, he hadn't. He purposely delivered you into the hand of the Midians. He purposely said, you're going to be in captivity and it's going to get back. Why? 
has he forsaken you? You've not obeyed my voice. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this, thy might. In the image. Threshing the wheat. Hey, the Lord's with you, thou mighty man of valor. Oh, well, if the Lord is with us, then why, where's all the miracles? Where's all this cool stuff that he did for our grandfathers and great grandfathers? Where's all that? You see, God had forsaken us. He has allowed the Midianites to come in. No, no. You have forsaken him. But it's time for you to stop cowering in the wine press over there, Gideon. It's time for you to stand up and go in thy might. That, and thou shalt save Israel. Pay attention to verse number 14 here. Thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Gideon, I'm going to use you. It's time for you to stand up. And the Lord said unto him, verse number 16, uh, I think I skipped verse 15, let me read that. And he said unto him, Oh my Lord, where shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor. Excuse me, all of Israel is poor. They were greatly impoverished. But my family is poor. It means they're poorer than the poor of the poor. My family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Listen, I got I got brothers, I've got others, but you got the wrong guy, God. And the Lord. You recognize it if you grab your focus here at verse number 16. That's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital P. He's having a conversation with Jesus right now. The Son of God. The second part of the Trinity, if you will. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. And thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. You don't even need to have an army with you. I'm going to use you. Gideon, you're going to smite the Midianites and one man. Man, what a cool thing. And he, that's Gideon, said unto him, that's the Lord, if now I have found grace in thy sight, will it be, stop for just a moment here. Did anybody wake up this morning believing that it was God's duty to come and speak to you? It, it, it was, it was, he is, God was obligated to come and be in your presence. He's already found the grace of God. He didn't deserve any of that. He didn't deserve God speaking to him. He didn't deserve God appearing unto him. He didn't deserve to have a conversation. But he says this, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest to me. Come on, Gideon. Verse number 12 says this, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Who's he think he's been talking to for five verses here as we recorded in time? I'm wondering if I'm actually seeing what I'm seeing. And in this classroom right now, Brother Jeff is on the back side of that phone. And I'm looking into it. Hopefully we're engaging just a little bit here. All right? Uh, it would, it, it's a real, uh, it's crude in the imagery here, but I'm wondering if I've actually seen Jeff. Brother Jeff, if you're here, would you, would you just say something? It, it, it's ludicrous. You had a conversation. You appear, he's appeared unto you. He said, you listen, quit cowering over here. Stand up, go in thy mind. I'm going to deliver you. You're going to deliver the Midianites. And you're going to, excuse me. You're going to deliver the children of the Israel out of the hand of the Midianites as one man. Listen, stand up. If I have found grace in my sight, I'm wondering if, I'm wondering if you, if, 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 if you're actually here, my goodness. He's a long way from where he needs to be, isn't he? The angel said, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. 
Don't choose me. I mean, my family's poor in Manasseh here. I mean, we're, we're, we're poorer than the poor. Which, we're all poor. And I'm the least of my family. What in the world? What is Gideon doing here? We're going to do verse number 15 again because it's just mind-boggling me how ludicrous Gideon is acting here. Well, he's sure not acting like a man of valor. He's certainly not acting like a mighty man of valor. And he said unto him, O oh, my Lord, wherein shall I save Israel? Uh, Gideon, it's not you. But God's going to use you. Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. Why does he have to say that twice? You already told him the God is with you. Verse number 12. Surely I will be with you, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me, O my soul. Depart not hence, this is Gideon speaking, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present. And I said it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. So what Gideon's going to do here is I remind you he's threshing wheat in a wine press. The land has been decimated, so I'm not quite sure where he got any of it to find anywhere. But he's about to go and make some food for what he believes to be is what he said was Lord. And presented as a present. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and a lot of cakes and an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in the basket, and he put forth, excuse me, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it unto him under the oak, and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth, broth excuse me, and he, that's Gideon, did so. A lot of verse number 21. And the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened case, and there arose up fire out of the rock. I wish I can honestly, I can't wait to see that. I, I believe when we get to heaven, I believe God's going to allow us to watch Blu-ray, DVD, hologram, which is what I think it's going to be. But I believe we're going to be able to see that. I cannot wait to see this take place. Gideon goes and he, I find out greatness in thy sight. Would you, would you do me a favor? Would you stay here? I want to present a gift unto you. Because I don't know if I'm actually seeing you. Crazy to me. But he goes and he prepares. Where did he get the kid? Where did he get the ephod? Where did he get the I don't know. But he comes and he presents this unto God. And God says, hey, lay out the flesh upon this rock and, and pour the broth upon it. And, and the Lord takes the staff that's in his hand and he, he touches it. And <laughs> fire comes out of the rock. Wow. It's cool. And the, angel, and the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes and there arose up from the there arose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes and watch and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight boom gone vanished it doesn't have the intention that Gideon got to watch him walk away <laughs> boom now watch and Gideon the Bible uses an interesting word here. Perceived. Wow. I think that was actually God. Watch. And Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. Who did he think he was talking to? Are you kidding me? And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not. He's going to tell him something new here. Something he hasn't heard up until this moment of time. He presents a present for the God. God instructs him, lay it out before, lay it out on this rock, pour out the raw for the, the flesh and the, and the, the uh, bread, if you will. And the, and, 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 and the Lord touched him. The fire comes up. And God is gone. 
God getting us. I received, I said, glory to the Lord. Wow. And God begins to speak to them now. Again. I believe this is audibly. I don't think Gideon's able to see anything here. But he hears. I personally, I, I don't know that I can prove it scripturally. I believe this is uh, maybe God the Father speaking unto him. And the Lord, I guess that's Jesus, said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not. And here's that new thing. Thou shalt not die. You see, when Gideon was over here in the line press, threshing wheat, the high, the medians, probably a little worried about his life. Now, God says, Thou shalt not die. And Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day, yet an Orpha and the Abazarites there. And it came to pass, verse number 25, that same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old. And throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath. Hmm. You know that, that uh, an altar that your dad's been worshiping on here? The altar to Baal. Go throw it down. And cut down the grove that is by it. Well, the grove is where they got the wood to continue to build false gods. So go, go take your father's, <laughs> your father's altar, and go ahead and, 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 and destroy it. And the grove that's by it, cut all that down as well. And build an altar unto the Lord. Now, he's already built an altar unto the Lord. But God is telling him, build another one. And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock. And the ordered place, and take the second bullock, and offer a burnt sacrifice for the wood of the grove, which thou shalt should cut down. Now, wait a second here. If his daughter, if his dad, excuse me, his daughter, if his dad has another bullock there, that is about the only thing left to eat. The land's been decimated. There's nothing of, of sustenance there. Nothing. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants. I'm sorry, didn't he say he was poor? Didn't he say we're the poorest of the poor? And I, I'm the least of my family? Gideon took his servants, ten men of his servants, and did as the Lord said unto him. And so it was because, watch, hmm, before I read that next phrase, I want to remind you of what God had just spoke to him. After he presented the gift, after the fire consumed it, and after God vanished away. God said unto him, in verse number 23, And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee. Fear not, thou shalt not die. Fear not, thou shalt not die. You gotta remember that, because now watch in verse number 27 here. And Gideon took ten men of his servants and did, and, said, excuse me, and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared the very thing God told him not to do, because he feared his father's household, and the men of the city. He was afraid of what his dad would say. He was afraid of what his dad's friends would say. That he did this. He did it by night. He obeyed God. In the essence of the action that God asked him to do. But he did not obey God. In the valor of who he was supposed to be. He ought to have just gone in the day as God said that and take his men and said, come on, guys, let's go. It don't matter. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Rip it down. Pour it. Cut them all down. Cut all that grove down. Because he's not supposed to fear. He's only been promised by God you shall not die. But he goes at night and he cuts down that grove and he tears down that altar. And when in the middle of the city, verse number 20, right, arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal, the devil, a false god that they had been worshiping. And when the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down that was by it, 
And the second bowl that was offered upon the altar that was built. They said one to another, Who had done this thing? They're mad. Oh man, they're mad. When they inquired and asked, they said, And the Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this. And the Midian and the men of the city said unto Joash, that's Gideon's dad. I look, just look now, and I see it's at 45 minutes. Give me five more minutes time, I'll finish. And we'll pick up the next time from where we're at. Uh, and when they had inquired and they asked and said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thou son, thou, bring out thy son, that he may die. Their intention is to kill Gideon. Now I remind you, why did he cut it down at night? The Bible clearly says he feared his father and the men of the city. The men of the city, he was exactly right. Their intention, because he had just taken down the altar, he destroyed it, and he cut down the grove, their intention was, we're going to kill you because you did that. You're about to die, Gideon. But he didn't just fear the men of the city. The Bible says he feared his father's household as well. That's what happened to the father. And Joash, that's Gideon's dad, said unto all that stood up against him. Or does the Bible doesn't say up. And all that stood against him. Will you leave for Baal? Are you, are you really going to go on the devil's side of this matter? Are you going to beg that we should be worshiping a false god? Will he save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death while he's yet mourning. Hey, if you want to go on that side, let's just go ahead and kill you instead. And if he be God, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. If he's a God, if Baal is real, let him go ahead and plead for himself. Let him make it. Therefore, on that day, oh, I like this verse number 32. Therefore, on that day, called him, that's Joash, called him, that's Gideon, Jeroboam. His dad switched his name. Uh, Gideon's no longer going to work for me anymore. Your new name is going to be Jeroboam. We'll get into next week about the meaning of those uh, those names. They're pretty cool. It gives you a little, kind of a little bit of insight there. He says, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Uh, 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 I just lost my place. Jezreel, there we go. But, I like that. There's a great word of contrast there. So during this time taking place, here comes the Midianites, here comes the Amalekites, here comes the children of the east, and last time they came, they came to destroy the land. They come up again, but we have a great contrast of a word here, and we'll end with this right here. The Bible says this, but, because while this is taking place, while they pitched in this valley of Jezreel, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Now, as a child of God today, living in this church age that you and I find ourselves in, the moment one gets saved, the Spirit of God comes and dwells within us. But in the Bible times here in Judges chapter 6, that was not the case. The Spirit of God dwelt upon man sometimes, well, for a long time, David. Uh, sometimes, like Saul, the Spirit of the Lord left, or dwelt upon him and then left. Look, it's at this point that the Spirit of God comes boom, upon Gideon. And we're going to see a great contrast here as we get into this next week. A great contrast of what takes place when the Spirit of God is evident in Gideon's life. Teens, you ought not to be in fear right now. COVID-19, we're all kind of done with it. <laughs> we're just kind of done with the social distancing. And hopefully we're, we're days or weeks away from this being just, just uh, I don't know the right word to use for it there. I like to use the word stupidity. I believe social distancing was important. I think it's probably the rent of months of lives behind here. But don't ever be in fear. There's a God in heaven 
that loves you. His promise is to sustain you and provide for all your needs. Gideon has brought to life his important lesson. We find ourselves now with the Spirit of God dwelling upon Gideon. The same Spirit of God that lives in your life right now. I'd say the message you've given in the beginning is the same message given unto you as a child of God. Fear not. Fear not. Obey my voice. Let's pray. Father, God, before you, I said again, I pray that this would be of help, guidance, and uh, blessing to us. I pray that you help us grow thereby. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen.